So the question is, why do something when you could do nothing? Why invest yourself in the lives of immigrants and refugees? Why take on somebody else's problems when you have enough problems of your own? Well, I think there are many good moral, economic, social, and political reasons to care about the welfare of immigrants and refugees. But as Christians, I think the most compelling and the most motivating reason is because God cares for immigrants and refugees. And while God loves all that he has made, all of his creation, all human beings, the Bible teaches us that God has a special concern for those who are the most vulnerable in our society. And that includes orphans, widows, the poor, and among them are counted immigrants. And there's good reason for that because even today, under the best of circumstances, resettling in a new country, becoming a stranger in a strange land, starting from scratch in a new place where you don't know the language and you don't know the customs and the culture and you don't have family and friends around you as a support network can be extremely challenging. But we know that most of the immigrants and refugees that come to our shores are not coming under the best of circumstances. Instead, they are fleeing violence and poverty and persecution, unable to stay in their country of origin, but not exactly welcome anywhere else. They are people without a place to call home. And that makes them very vulnerable dependent upon the welcome and the hospitality of others, dependent upon others to create space for them. Now I said that God cares for the immigrant and the refugee. And to say that, to say that God has a great concern for those who are the most vulnerable in our society is not to say that the Bible is naive about issues of safety and security. The Bible doesn't present God as holding some kind of romantic notion about foreigners. In fact, the Bible seems to have a pretty clear notion of the insidiousness of sin and the extent in which sin has infected human beings. And the Bible seems pretty clear that at times, foreigners can be a potential danger. They can pose a threat to ancient Israel. This awareness is reflected in the fact that the Bible uses different terms to distinguish between different kinds of foreigners. Take, for instance, the Hebrew word zur. Zur is something which contaminates or which does harm. And when referring to a foreigner, it is often associated with an invading or an attacking army. Obviously, Israel is to protect herself against the zur. Another term we find in the Old Testament to refer to the foreigner is the term nahar. Nahar is something that is strange or unknown, someone who might pose a threat, but not necessarily. When this term is used to describe foreigners in the Old Testament, it refers to those who aren't necessarily interested in joining ancient Israel as a people. They're not committed to Israel's welfare. They're not willing to live by Israelite law. And it's not a term that is used often in the Old Testament, but when it is used, it is often used in a very t cautious way. It is used um, somewhat negatively to speak about foreigners. So for instance, in Exodus 12, the foreigner, the Nahar, may not participate in the Passover. With regard to the Zur and the Nahar then, ancient Israel took a rather cautious stance to protect themselves against any potential threat that these populations might hold. But the fact that some foreigners were clearly identified as threats did not prevent ancient Israel from accepting and welcoming foreigners altogether. Instead, there was a class of people that Israel was to welcome as full participants in the community. This class of foreigners was referred to as the Gur, and they are the ones who receive the most attention in the Bible. We might better translate this term as the immigrant because these were the people 
who wanted to settle down among ancient Israel, to live among the people who submitted to their laws and the values of ancient Israel. All the positive texts in the Old Testament are about these folks who were deemed not to be a security risk. With respect to the Gur, Israel was specifically commanded not to oppress or take advantage of them, but rather to treat them justly and fairly as if they were one of their own. Law, the law legislated that ancient Israel should help immigrants in a variety of ways. They should leave the gleanings in their fields for them to enjoy. Immigrants could benefit from the tithes that were given for the poor and from other laws in ancient Israel that were designed to curb poverty, like the year of Jubilee. Immigrants were even welcome to participate in Israel's religious festivals, the Passover, the Sabbath, the Feast of Weeks, they could be circumcised as a symbol of their joining the community, not so different from the pledge that we ask citizens to take in this country. We see this hospitable and inclusive attitude in texts like Leviticus 19, where we read, when an immigrant resides among you in your land, do not mistreat them. The immigrant residing among you must be treated as your native born, Love them as you love yourself, for you were foreigners in Egypt. And when you reap the harvest of your land, do not reap to the very edges of your field or gather the gleanings of your harvest. Do not go over your vineyard a second time or pick the grapes that have fallen. Leave them for the poor and the immigrant. And also in Deuteronomy 24, do not deprive the immigrant and the fatherless of justice or take the cloak of the widow as a pledge. Remember that you were slaves in Egypt and the Lord your God redeemed you from there. This is why I command you to do this. One of the things that you should notice in each of those passages that I read is that they don't just legislate justice. They also legislate compassion. That sets the bar really high for ancient Israel in terms of how they were to treat the foreigner, the immigrant, and the refugee. They were to leave the gleanings in their field. They were to not mistreat them. They were to love them as themselves. One place we see this compassion modeled especially well is in the story of Abraham, Sarah, and Hagar. Now the name Hagar is actually, it sounds a lot like the Hebrew word for the foreigner or the immigrant, Hagar. In some ways, the Bible is inviting us then to consider Hagar as the representative immigrant, the one who has been taken from their homeland or who has left their homeland and now finds themselves as strangers in a strange land. Hagar was an Egyptian maidservant in the household of Abraham and Sarah. And because Sarah was barren, Abraham and Sarah decided to use Hagar as a surrogate mother, to have a child through her. Now what is striking is that when Abraham and Sarah talk about Hagar, they never refer to her by name. They always refer to her as the Egyptian maidservant or the Egyptian slave. It's a diminutive way of talking about her that accentuates her lowly station and her status as property. To Abraham and Sarah, Hagar was not really a person. She was more a role and a category. She was an immigrant. She was a slave. She was the other. And I suspect that it is this distance that they created between themselves and Hagar that actually allowed them to mistreat her in the way that they did, oppressing her enough so that she flees to the wilderness. Now, when we read the story of Abraham, Sarah, and Hagar, we discover that God's attitude towards Hagar was very different. It stands in stark contrast to the way that Abraham and Sarah treated Hagar. When the angel of the Lord 
meets Hagar in the wilderness. The angel, first of all, calls her by her name, acknowledging her humanity, recognizing that she is a person with an identity and a story that she is made in the image of God and has inherent dignity and worth. In this small gesture, the angel of the Lord indicates that God sees Hagar. God sees her suffering and oppression. God sees her humanity. And God sees her potential, sees all that she is going to be. She is going to become the mother of a great nation, the text tells us. In response, Hagar gives testimony to this God who sees her, naming God, God, um, naming God Elroy, the God who sees me. Through scripture, the testimony of God is that God is the one who sees the vulnerable. He sees Hagar. He sees the oppressed. He sees the widow. He sees the poor. He sees the immigrant. And he cares for them. He loves them. He calls them by name. At the beginning, I asked the question, why do something when we could do nothing? Why invest ourselves in the lives of immigrants and refugees? But perhaps that's the wrong question. Perhaps the question I should be asking is, who will follow God's lead? Who will take up the cause of the immigrant and the refugee? Who will follow God's heart in this? Who will see what God sees? Who will love what God loves? Who will act with the compassion with which God acts? Will you? Deuteronomy 10 tells us, the Lord God defends the cause of the fatherless and the widow and loves the immigrant residing among you, giving them food and clothing. And you also are to love the immigrant. The Refugee and Immigration Collaborative, connecting global neighbors. This collaborative was brought together with support from Calvin College, the Calvin Alumni Association, and the Calvin Center for Christian Scholarship.